if you are feeling anything the way that I'm feeling from a point of view of our careers and maybe in just in life in general, it's a little bit, a little bit of a mountain climbing hike. I think in very many respects as lean people, we are like mountain climbers, like hikers, where we kind of, we understand where we're trying to get to, we pick a path to try to get to it, and then we kind of have to go, okay, well maybe that wasn't the right path, so we reset and we go back down to base camp, and we go, okay, well maybe we needed some different tools for this particular hike, and then we go back up again, and then as soon as we finally do get to the top, guess what? It's a good old fashioned, we go, oh, this wasn't the top. Look at there's the other mountain over there that we need to get to. So what I'd like to do is take about the next hour and just talk to you a little bit about my journey uh, so far because I think that, you know, I, I've learned one thing. There's the, the easiest thing to talk about is oneself. I've learned that, uh, you know, over my 51 years. But I think it's also important for us to be able to reflect as leaders. And this is, uh, this is something that I've been doing lately. I don't know for, for those of you in the room, there's something about turning 50 that just makes you a little bit more reflective. Um, and I don't think there's anything wrong with this at all. So, with this, but, but there is going to be some themes of my talk today. And the themes are going to be that I'm starting to actually, I'm not, I'm not there yet. I still haven't actually figured out what this whole lean OPEX thing is. But I'm starting to kind of hone in on some things. And one of the things I'm definitely honing in on is that this is about decision making. That as leaders, at the end of the day, at the end of the day, what we're really doing is making decisions. And how are we doing that is something that we need to be asking ourselves. All of a sudden, I started to recognize that when we make decisions, as business leaders, when we make decisions, two things happen. One is intended consequences, the things that we want to happen because of this decision, and the second is unintended consequences, just like in Yellowstone. So, and this, and this is what's going on. And so when I realize that, I go, oh my gosh, so this is different thinking now. Because it's not, as a leader, I'm not saying, okay, this is what we're going to do because this is what we're going to get. I now have to stop, and I, there's a part B to my conversation, and that is, what are the unintended consequences of this decision? So in other words, we've spent a lot of time talking about what our manufacturing strategy is. One Piece Flow, Ajunka. What about the question, how does our manufacturing strategy impact the rest of the business? That is a fundamentally different question. What's our distribution strategy? What's our transportation strategy? What's our warehousing strategy? Those are good questions, but I think a more powerful question is, how does our transportation strategy impact the rest of the business? Because if you have that conversation, you're going to get a whole different list of things that we should be working on. And you will get a whole different perspective from people relative to what's going on in the business. So this idea of intended consequences and, in, and unintended consequences is a very, very important thing for us to be able to understand as leaders. And from my point of view, it's the first part of becoming a systems thinker. In the world of systems thinking, there's people believe that you are either genetically predisposed to be a systems thinker or you're not. I can't believe that. I can't sign up for that. We have to be able to learn how to be able to say what's going on here at a big picture. We're not genetically predisposed to be able to see at 50,000 feet. It's not about seeing the forest or the trees. It's about seeing the forest and the trees. And we can do that as leaders. There are, in fact, some characteristics, techniques, personality traits, I don't know what you want to call them. I don't like personality traits because that would suggest that you either have it or you don't, and that can't be what this is about. So let's call them techniques. But there is no question that from a lean point of view, from a people point of view, there is a humbling that needs to take place in us as leaders. 
And we need to recognize that to be an effective leader, and this isn't just about lean and OpEx, to be an effective leader, we have to become part teacher and we have to become part student. And we have to recognize that every single day we have an opportunity to teach some and we have an opportunity to learn some. And it's the, your willingness and your openness and bait, frankly your interest and passion to do those two things is what's going to separate um, us from the leaders that are going to truly make a difference in our workplaces in the world and those that are just going to continue on um, being directive and trying to get goals done through objectives. The world is changing. There's no question about it. So we checked in again and this is a belief for me. Our collective skills, talents, approaches and management systems are struggling to keep pace, aka does anybody really know for certain what to do? I, I believe at this point that we are all, as leaders, experimenting. That, I'll just, the supply chain world. If there was a, if there was a human being that their resume said, I can go and I can fix your supply chain if you have somebody disrupting it and e-commerce is disrupting with it, all you need to do is hire me, then that person would be well sought after. What's happening is we're, we, have, we, have, uh, we have wisdom from our experiences and our resumes, and, but, but we're also saying, you know what? What are we got to do here? We just got to try some stuff. Even the people that are disrupting, the disruption is not this highly strategic disruption. This disruption is people, cor companies that are just trying stuff and they have cash and support to try stuff and fail and try more stuff and fail. And we have traditional organizations that that just does, they're like, that, the disruption isn't about, isn't about next day delivery. I don't believe that. Next day delivery is, is, is gonna meet its logical conclusion and within three years from now, everybody will be able to do next day delivery. And there'll be 60% uh, of SKUs will be able to deliver within an hour in the next 10 years. That, that's just a logical, that's just tactics. We'll get, we'll get there. The real disruption is how can some organizations, you know, more classic traditional organizations who have expectations for profitability experiment, fail, experiment, fail, experiment, fail when these experiments require cash. So fundamentally we're going to have to do something differently because I don't think that at this point what's happening on the outside is happening faster than what's happening on the inside in our ability to be able to learn to know what to do. In my mind, I you know, believe from a Lean and OpEx point of view, this has got to be the next frontier. And I know it's not really you know, crazy exciting. It's not about technology and apps and all those types of things. This is about core processes. This is about functions. This is about functions saying that we are a business, we are a system. And as a system, we need to manage the system together. We need to care about Yellowstone Park. We need to understand that this is an ecosystem and that everything we do has to be about keeping the ecosystem healthy. It is time for us to connect the business. It's got to be. If this isn't the time, if businesses that are good, solid businesses are looking at possible failure, in particular in the retail world, would you, do you really want, as a CEO, do you really want to fail instead of just getting three executives together and saying, can you people please start collaborating? Like, there's a part of me that just does not understand why this is so difficult, honestly. But obviously it is, because we've been talking about this for a long time. But I think it's time and that we're going to see. So we need a new language. We need a new language that, we're gonna, that we need to be able to speak because the current language with the current biases of our leaders is not working. And what we do know about lean, right? 
is that if it ain't working, we, we lean leaders do not sign up for Einstein's theory of insanity. We just go, okay, that didn't work. I really thought it was going to, and I'm a little surprised it didn't, but you know, as people often say to me, Robert, what have you learned after 13 years of building Lean Core? And I say, well, you know what? I'm not sure what I've learned, but I'll tell you what my favorite saying is. It seemed like a good idea at the time. <laughs> and you look back, right? What are we trying to accomplish? What are we trying to accomplish? No matter what business, whether it's product-oriented or service-oriented, we are trying to get the perfect order. We are trying to get the right product to the right place at the right time and the right quantity and the right quality at the right price and the right cost from the right, from the right sources and the right, with the right services, all with the right complexity. That is what we are trying to accomplish. But this is not a language that we speak in business. But interesting enough, it's a language that Dr. Goldsby and thousands of other logistics professors teach in first year, first class. First class in business school, you learn about the 10 rights and the perfect order. And you graduate and you go into businesses and we never even hear about it again. But it's what we're all trying to accomplish. So, you know, in the spirit of trying to be, you know, provocative and thought provoking, could you imagine if that's what a, a corporate structure looked like inside an organization? You had the CEO of Perfect Order, and then you had vice presidents that were all responsible to ensure that one right was getting done. Almost all business decisions, no matter where they are made, manifest themselves inside the supply chain. So Lean and OpEx is about value and waste, right? We want to maximize customer value at the lowest possible total cost and show respect for our communities and for people while we're doing it. That is our, that's our ultimate goal, value and waste. Well, if you're in product development and you make a business decision, you don't actually create value and waste in product development. You create value or waste in the supply chain. If you make a business decision in sales and marketing, you don't create value or waste in sales and marketing. You create value or waste in the supply chain. And similarly, if you're in supply chain, the same thing. So what this means is that this supply chain we have from our customer, through distribution, through manufacturing, up to the supplier, it holds all of this knowledge about every business decision that was made inside our organization. There's stuff that hasn't moved for three years inside our DCs. Nobody is going to that box and blowing it off, blowing the dust off, and then going, hey, what were the assumptions we made when we thought this was a good idea? Why did we think this product was going to sell? And it's not about pointing fingers. This isn't about to make anybody feel bad. It's, it's about, hey, we're making new decisions right now about new products. Wouldn't it make sense to stop, take a deep breath, and say, how did that last product go? We made all these assumptions about it, about how we were going to build it, how we were going to promote it, how we were going to design it, and we believed if we do all those things that it's going to sell this much. And it's going to sell this much here and here and over there. But we're so busy going straight that nobody stops and says, wait a minute. Let's talk about what happened. Reflection. Lean leadership. Let's reflect a little bit so we can get it right. So we can understand what assumptions we made. What assumptions held true. What assumptions didn't hold true. How do we learn going forward? The supply chain is this repository of an incredible amount of knowledge. And we need to build feedback systems. We have every single, the technology is there. Visibility, pull, uh, the, the, any, all the technology we need for, for, for uh, the supply chain to go from supplier to the end customer. It's all there. It's going to continue to perfect, but we're not lacking there. What we don't have, what we don't have is an equal amount of momentum from what actually happened back to the people. Back to product development. 
back to sales and marketing, and even distribution back to manufacturing, to manufacturing back to purchasing, even inside the end-to-end. -end. This, this, this reverse feedback is just not happening at the level of rigor that it needs to happen, so we just continue to move forward at lightning speeds. Why? Because everything's being disrupted right now. All, you know, I don't want to say this, but there's, in, in some areas, it's almost panic mode. Got to do something because we're now measuring survival here, and, me and survival is not being measured in decades. It's being measured in years or months in some cases.